Yes, go ahead. You're on. Thank you. Um, I want to thank Larry for inviting me. Uh, I've presented one or two times here. Uh, once again, my name is Bob Frankrone. I'm a member, longtime member, uh, 35 plus years of uh, Division 8 here in Louisville. Uh, I'm happy to be with you guys this afternoon. And uh, uh, this presentation I put together a couple of years ago, I was very fortunate to have uh, attended the national, the NMRA National Convention in Salt Lake City in 2019. In fact, it's the last convention I've attended prior to the um, uh, shutdown with COVID and all the cancellations. So uh, that, the reason they had it in Salt Lake City that year, it was the 150th anniversary of the driving of the Golden Spike, which completed the Transcontinental Railroad in 1869. And uh, Salt Lake City is only uh, just, just under 90 miles uh, from that particular location. So they thought it would be a great uh, place to, uh, to hold a convention, to sort of commemorate that uh, monument, uh, momentous event. And uh, I was fortunate to uh, drive up there one uh, Sunday morning and take some pictures and did, came back, did some research, and I put together a little presentation. So I hope everybody enjoys it today. So <clears throat> your top picture is what it looked like in 1869. Fast forward 150 years, and that's what it looks like today. You see a replica of the Jupiter and Locomotive 119, which were the two uh, locomotives pictured in the original uh, uh, photograph uh, seen on that top panel there. So I think we're all old enough to recognize this iconic photograph from 1969 of Neil Armstrong walking on the moon. Now think back, I, I, I was like a junior in high school, something like that. So uh, think back where you were in 1969 when uh, we landed on the moon and that euphoria, that excitement, uh, I think the president declared the next day a national holiday if memory serves, I remember we didn't have to go to school. So that was a big deal when you're a kid. Uh, so just remember that excitement, what that was like, uh, that achievement, landing somebody on the moon. Back up a hundred years, almost to the, to the month. And they had just as an important of event, the driving of the Golden Spike at Promontory, Utah, which signified the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad. In 1869, that was a, as big of an event to the country as when we landed on the moon some hundred years later. This is the famous uh, champagne photo taken by a, a photographer. I think his name was Russell. And um, it's an iconic photo, not unlike the moon landing photo, uh, still very significant in, 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 in American history. I'm sure at one time or another, many of you have seen this photograph. So what we're going to do this afternoon, <clears throat> we're going to visit the Golden Spike National Historic Park in Promontory, Utah. We're going to view the replica locomotives, the Jupiter and 119, uh, at the at the site of the actual driving of the Golden Spike. We're going to take the we're going to walk the East Hiking Trail, which is a really neat experience. We're going to drive both the East and West driving trails. I'm getting some feedback there, and we're going to look at historical photographs along our journey. So the archival photograph credits go to two gentlemen. Now you got to remember the state of the art in photography back in 1869. So these guys were hired by their respective railroads. Uh, Alfred Hart was hired by the Central uh, Pacific as their photographer. You know, it's, you hire on, this is what you're going to do. It was a very special, you know, we all didn't have cameras that we carry around in our pockets like we do today. 150 years ago, it was a very, uh, special 
it was like a trade, knowing how to take a photograph, knowing how to develop photographs. So the Central Pacific hired Alfred Hart to photograph their progress of uh, building the Transcontinental Railroad. And the Union Pacific hired Andrew J. Russell to photograph their uh, Union Pacific came from the east going toward the west and the Central Pacific came from the west going toward the east. So they had photographers that photographed um, you know, the day-to-day -day events that, that took place. In fact, Russell was the uh, gentleman who took that, if, um, if memory serves him right, took that famous, now famous uh, champagne photograph. So a brief timeline, in 1832, you already had proponents in this country calling for a transcontinental railroad. They wanted to link the country together. They wanted to uh, develop the inter um, uh, regions of our continent and develop more commerce, to open it up to uh, um, uh, business, to, to uh, uh, people, uh, you know, building communities. In 1853, Congress appropriates, so look at the time, you know, it's almost 20 years, uh, it was over 20 years before Congress finally appropriated $150,000 to survey five different routes. Okay, if we're going to link the continent by rail, how are we going to do that? Where, where are we going to do it? And of course, everybody vies for their own, you know, they want the railroad to come through their town. That was a big deal in, in terms of generating business, revenue, jobs, everything. So in 1861, the Central Pacific Railroad was incorporated. In 1862, a year later, Lincoln signs the Pacific Railroad Act, which is a huge deal because it says, all right, gentlemen, we're really serious. We, we want to uh, link both coasts of our country. We want to tie this uh, uh, country together. And we're going in the railroad, that was the, the latest, greatest mode of transportation at the time. Up to then, people were either walking or going on horse or mule or something like that. So the railroad was a big uh, uh, you know, was a big thing in 1862. In 1863, the Union Pacific is incorporated, and of course, those are the two railroads that are charted with uh, building the line. And in 1869, the first transcontinental railroad is completed May 10th at Promontory, Utah, and that is the uh, was the uh, significant achievement. 150 years ago. So to locate you graphically, uh, you can see Salt Lake City at the top of the map of Utah there. Uh, the red star is promontory. And I think when I uh, drove up there, I, I put like 88 miles on my car from my hotel to the actual historical site. So roughly 90 miles from Salt Lake City, about an hour and a half drive. I went up there on a Sunday morning and it was uh, wonderful. Uh, an exploded view, you can see that the um, uh, original route, which is uh, designated in the uh, red dashed line, was abandoned in 1904. So they used it for about 35 years. And then they, you know, with the technology of the time in the early 20th century, they were able to bridge, if you will, uh, the Great Salt Lake. So that cut off uh, uh, um, a lot of mileage and made for a much more uh, efficient route. You didn't have to go through any mountains or anything like that. So, and my understanding is you can, there are still remnants of the original route and you can, if you have a Jeep or a, an all-terrain vehicle, you can uh, trace that route. Um, and there are enough markers along the way uh, if you're bold and daring and, and not worried about getting lost in the high desert you can uh, trace that route. It's the Lucen cutoff is how they refer to that. Going to the city out west, Lucen, you can see on the map there. So the park is now a National Historic Site. It's maintained by the, by the park system. So, you know, it's a treasure that will be here for generations to come. Uh, Sunday morning, there was not a whole lot of activity, which I, which I like. I, you know, Two months earlier, the convention was in July. The celebration that year took place in, in May, May 10th. 
and they had something like 20,000 people each day. And it's just a two lane road getting to this place out in the middle of the desert. I couldn't even imagine, I guess they charted people in buses or something because 20,000 people, you would have had a traffic jam 20 miles long. Um, so I can't even uh, imagine that. So Promontory is it's in the high desert. It's not quite a mile high, but almost 4,900 uh, feet. So that's the site uh, where they actually drove the Golden Spike. That's what it looks like today. And that's what it looked like 150 years earlier. So just to uh, orient you, the <clears throat> park itself consists of uh, the visitor center area and then the east and west driving areas. So you can actually drive your car on the abandoned roadbed. You know, all the rail and, and ties and everything are gone. And on the east side, you can actually take a walking tour in addition to um, uh, a driving tour. And the exploded view, as you can see the visitor center, um, the gift, the uh, uh, railroad shop, the, the engine house and all that. It's a walking tour, driving tour. And so there's an aerial view. So the park access, just a two lane road. There's your visitor center down here. That's the engine house. See the Y where they can turn the locomotives. And just an exploded view of that, the visitor center, and they got a little museum there. It's very nice, very wonderful. And of course, the side of the last spike, and you can see when this uh, satellite photograph was taken, the, the engines were on display. And that's their seating area. They have uh, certain times during the year, they have reenactments, um, which I imagine are quite fun. People in period costume, um, pretending to drive the golden spike. Like I said, Sunday morning, it wasn't very crowded, which, which I enjoyed. I got to walk around and um, there is the actual laurel tie, um, not a replica, not the, not the one, um, I think the original one, when it was removed, was put in a museum and I think it was uh, preserved. And then I think the museum burned or something and, and, and destroyed it. But anyway, and you can notice the, uh, uh, pre-drilled holes for the spikes. So that's what, you know, the, the golden spikes are very soft. And of course, you know, the guys driving them are these, you know, executives and all. So they, they're not good at swinging mallets or anything like that, right? So they sit behind the desk. So they pre-drilled, the, made it as easy as possible. And my understanding was that there were actually four golden spikes used. So probably uh, two on the inner rails and, and two more on the outer rails. And that tells you, uh, who, who was in charge 150 years ago? Who presidents of the, of the railroads? So here's a view looking east and you're in high desert. So there's not a whole lot of anything out there, which is nice because, you know, in an urban, in an urban environment, uh, a friend of mine, Charlie Bicola, always talks about the urban eraser. He says every 50 years, it's like somebody just erased everything and, and the sites and the buildings and everything looks totally different than it did 50 years ago. It was all erased and replaced by something else. And I think that's very true because places I haven't been to in, in quite some time, large urban centers, you go back, I don't remember any of this, it looks all different. Out here in the desert, 150 years ago, it looked pretty much the same. There's nothing out there. This was the day of the celebration, of course. Uh, a lot of people came out to turn out because it was a big deal. It was a big deal completing the railroad. And looking west, and again, high desert, nothing out there. And pretty much the same 150 years ago. There's no urban eraser in this super remote area. So this is some of the artifacts here. These are uh, some of the railroad ties. You know, they were sort of like hand hewn uh, back in the early, early days of railroading and they weren't necessarily all that uniform. This is a cart. Now, uh, I want you to remember this cart and the size of this is about the size of a bed of a modern day 
pickup, maybe even a little bit smaller, okay? So we'll talk about this guy later, this little mule drawn cart, but you can just get an idea of the size of that. Just imagine the bed of a pickup truck. Uh, some more ties, you can see how they're just kind of, uh, you know, not as uniform as today's modern ties that are all machined and, you know, uh, perfectly sized, one matching the other. So they rolled out the locomotives, and these things are quite colorful, and they're actual replicas made to the exact drawings that they, uh, they, they have for the original units, and um, the original units were quite as colorful. Now, I'm sure during their work life, you know, the colors, like anything, they fade, they, the engines get dirty, and there's rust, and, and you deal with all the other elements, like any other piece of machinery, but originally manufactured, they were very uh, brightly colored, sort of ornate locomotives, and, and you can see by the picture how, how bright and uh, almost gaudy in effect. Uh, in a sense, but it's uh, it's really neat. Just another view of it. So let's go back to 1869 and study this photograph for a minute because remember, this is a huge celebration. And you know, I'm a firm believer that that people throughout time, people are still the same. We're all humans. We're still the same. You know, technology changes. You know, scenery changes, everything, but people at their core are the same. So this is a big celebration. So a big celebration is what do you do? You have bands turned out. Well, if you look, those are drums, right? Over here, those are musical instruments. That's a band. They have a big band coming out to celebrate, you know, hauled all the way out to the desert because they're going to have music. They're going to have a little party. They're going to celebrate this big momentous event. Just like you'd see today, you know, you know, somebody would show up, you'd have music, you'd have people, you'd have food, refreshments, you'd have all that stuff, right? So in 1869, you can see that the band turned out because they're having a party. That's 119. Or no, I'm sorry, this is still the Jupiter. It's wood burning back in the day. All right. And you can see they didn't, <laughs> all kinds of scrap the wood. If it burned, that was acceptable. You can see the wood pile there in the tender. It's just anything that would burn, it looks like they were going to use for fuel. Now, 119 is a coal burner. And it's colorful in its own way, not as, not as bright, but still uh, very well uh, painted and a lot of brass. It, it just, you know, very pristine. And so there's a picture of it in 1869. And there's the band again, might be a different band, but you can see the musical, whoops, you can see the musical instruments that they're, that they're carrying. So everybody wanted to be, you know, think about photography in the day. You know, after the shot was taken, these guys didn't get to see it, right? So, you know, it was the whole process to develop it and all that kind of business, but everybody wanted to be in the picture, just like today. You can see the coal in the tender. I'm, I was impressed with how pristine these locomotives were. Of course, they're housed in the engine house for uh, long periods of time. They, they cart them out during certain hours, during certain weekends. They're not out here all the time, which, you know, otherwise they just deteriorate in the, in the desert climate. But um, uh, they bring them out. And, and if you visit the site, you'd want to check to see what the schedules are, because these are the stars of the show. Absolutely. So another photograph. Uh, it's a very well documented event, very important event. See the guy on top of the flagpole there? He's, he's a brave soul. He wants to get the, a bird's eye view of everything. Just some more archival photographs. It's a view looking southeast. And if you notice at the very right over here, these are tents because no hotels or anything. So the people that 
were over there that maybe had to stay overnight or whatever, they just put up a tent. You know, it's not unlike you'd see today for the crowds going to Churchill Downs for the Derby. People camp out in Iroquois Park. What do they do? They throw up tents, right? Because there's not, you can't accommodate that mass of people. So uh, 150 years ago. Here's an interesting photograph. I studied this for a while. So this is right before the ceremony. Notice you got a, you got a, a soldier here who he's probably addressing the crowd, right? I mean, he's front and center, center of the track. He's probably having a speech or whatever. Maybe he's the leader of the company. You can see all the soldiers lined up here. And these may be the army tents. I don't know. I'm not sure. Again, some more of the tents, how people set up. But <clears throat> notice right here, that's a tripod for a camera, right? And there's a little step ladder for the guy to get up, for the photographer to climb up, uh, either Russell or Hart, whichever one. All right. And he's going to take a shot. Now, before I go to the next shot, somebody who took the shot you're looking at now was probably standing on top of the locomotive somewhere, sort of behind, uh, obviously behind the, uh, the the uh, steam dome and the smokestack and all that. Maybe he was standing on top of the cab. I don't know, but obviously somebody got a vantage point to take this very nice photograph, right? And somebody took a photograph from the other side. So I believe the next photograph you're going to say you're going to see was taken from this vantage point. So remember this guy here. All the soldiers lined up. The position of the people over here. Okay. That's the photograph that was taken from that vantage point. I'm almost 100% sure. So again, there's the guy in the middle, all the soldiers lined up and he's either, you know, you know, holding a place for the dignitaries to come out, keeping all the people at bay or whatever. It doesn't look like he's speaking to the crowd. Um, my guess is it's before the actual driving of the spike. So what about the picture where we saw the tripod and the step ladder? I don't see a photographer on this locomotive. Remember I said somebody must have been up here, maybe standing on the cab or something. I don't see anything. Well, then I look closely and I exploded an area. What's sticking out of this guy's head? Could that possibly be a camera that's on a tripod behind him? I mean, I, I don't think he's carrying something on his shoulder. I think that's probably the camera that took the photograph that you saw with the stepladder and the tripod uh, going the other way. Um, that's my thought on that. Anyway, it's interesting. I love studying these old photographs. So you can see the crowd. They're just, uh, you know, the guys on horseback, a major mode of transportation, right? They didn't have automobiles, no such thing yet. And that's what it looks like 150 years later. And, you know, I, I told somebody the other day, uh, I'm like, if you've ever seen an Alfred Hitchcock movie, Alfred Hitchcock appeared in every one of his movies for like maybe 10 to 15 seconds. You might see him getting on or off a bus. You might see him walking a dog down the street. Uh, you just might see him walking behind somebody who was having a conversation with somebody else. He always made a little cameo appearance. He never spoke, never, never lasted more than a few seconds, actually. So I thought that was always pretty cool because whenever I saw one of his movies, I always looked for him, you know, the first. And he always did this in the first five or ten minutes of the film. So I decided that every presentation I give, I'm going to have a photograph of me. In. So that's, <laughs> anyway, uh, there's a... Uh, uh, the engine inside of the engine house, uh, very nice, neat place. I don't know how much maintenance these things are required because in terms of mileage, you know, they only go, what, maybe a quarter of a mile out and a quarter of a mile back, um, you know, I don't know how many times a year. So they don't get a whole lot of wear and tear, but nonetheless, they are uh, uh, kept up and they're very um, uh, functional and you've got to have a place to do that. So that's, that's the engine house. So 
if you take a walk into the museum, you can see some of the, um, uh, the artifacts. You can see the old railroad ties, how small the rail actually was, some of the tools they used to maintain the gauge of the, of the rails. So the East Walking Tour, this was by far the best thing I did. It's one and a half miles. You go out on the Pacific Central Road bed and you return on the Union Pacific Road bed and you can walk out on what they call the Big Fill. Now, you got to remember, and you can view the side of the Big Trestle, understand that the Union Pacific and the Central Pacific, they didn't know where the two lines were going to meet up. That wasn't decided until something like a month before the actual driving of the Silver Spike. And, and grading of roadbed far uh, exceeded the actual laying of the rail. I mean, you might have roadbed graded 30, 40, 50, 60 miles out, and the people coming in and laying the rail behind that. So the Union Pacific and their um, excursion east and the or west and the Central Pacific and their excursion each, uh, east, they overlapped, if you will, something like 250 miles. Imagine that grading 250 miles because nobody would make a decision where the final link up was going to be. So when you're out there at Promontory, you can actually see the two separate roadbeds for that, you know, seven or 10 mile period that you drive on. I mean, it's really quite remarkable. And I've got some photographs that you know, show it really good. So on the walking trail, it's fantastic because you get to see the, the parallel grading efforts very readily. I mean, in some cases, these tracks were, uh, I mean, you could throw a stone and hit the other, uh, other roadbed. I mean, it's, they're that close. So here's a satellite view. And there's, you start the walking tour in the far left corner there. And that is the Central Pacific roadbed. And you can see it. I mean, there's no track or anything there, but this is a, you know, modern satellite photograph. And it's a very well-defined, and you can walk out on the path, and you walk all the way, if you will, walk all the way to the right of your screen, and then there's a little crossover path here, and then you return on the Union Pacific. Now, look at how close these two rail beds are together. That's probably, you know, at most a couple hundred feet, if that. It's really evident when you're out there. The um, Big Fill is right here. And that gap right here was the site of the Big Trestle. So now imagine it, it hadn't been determined yet which line was going to get the actual uh, 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 route. So uh, both of them, in their grading efforts, had to span that. The Central Pacific said, I'm going to use a cut and fill method. And so they just filled it in with a lot of dirt that they had. And the Union Pacific said, I'm going to build the trestle. And that's how they spanned it. Of course, the trestle, wooden trestle, long gone. There's no remnants of that. But you can see some of the footings. Uh, and and the, uh, uh, it's very obvious where it was. And you can see from this photograph. So you walk the road bed, and it's just a gravel road bed. Now, if you look out to the right, you can see right here, I'm walking on the Central Pacific. There is the Union Pacific road bed here. You can see the cut they made. I'm going to go this way. So again, that's probably a couple hundred feet, if, if, that, if that much. Central Pacific and Union Pacific. And it's very, and it's really neat to see that. And you're imagining, you know, the crew's maybe working side by side. He says, what are you, you know, what are you doing? We're, we're, we're duplicating each other's effort. Now, that's okay because we don't know who's going to get the, who's going to get the route. And they're looking back. You can see it quite easily. The route that I'm on here, the central and then the Union Pacific. Okay. Double grading effort. Um, that's looking south from where I am over the, the Salt Lake Basin there. Okay, pretty flat. That's the mountain range. So I'm continuing to walk because I want to see the big fill because you can actually, it's still in existence. You can walk across it. And you can see all these cuts. Notice they're, they're rough hewn. I mean, these were cut out by hand, right? 
And uh, Chinese was a great labor force for the Central Pacific. The Union Pacific had a lot of Italian and a lot of Irish um, and uh, a lot of uh, 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 people who migrated west after the Civil War. And uh, so you had a lot of uh, veterans, if you will, uh, build the railroad uh, coming from east to west. So there's the big fill. It's 500 feet in length and it's 70 feet tall. And I walked all the way across it. Now I'm looking back from where I was, okay? Now remember those little carts I told you to remember? And there's the side of the big trestle. And that's an aerial view I, I pulled off uh, somewhere of the big fill, okay? How did they make that fill? With mule-drawn carts that you saw earlier. They loaded them up with dirt. Now look at the dirt that it takes. You saw how big those beds were, not much bigger than the bed of a, of a pickup truck. And they just, it's a repetitive process. They attacked it from both ends. You can see them dumping the dirt here. And you can see these guys, they got fresh load. They're waiting their turn. They're dumping the dirt. Now, I, I can't even imagine how many you know, all day long going back and forth, fill up, dump, fill up, dump. The volume of dirt to make that fill compared to the volume of one of those carts, you must have had, you know, close to 500,000 trips or something. I mean, it's just, it's just incredible. So <clears throat> this is the site of the big trestle. If you will, here's one of the abutments right here. So there's, the, the, they graded a cut through here. Okay, and they had the wooden trestle here, and this is the uh, west end abutment here, and some of the, 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 the rock pilings are, are along the way, not really visible in the photo. But imagine this vantage point, which I thought, you know, this is a great place to take a photo. I was just out there. I didn't have any access. I didn't have any, I didn't do the research of the archival photos graphs until after the trip. So I found what I thought would be a good vantage point, and it turned out to be the same vantage point that the photographer 150 years ago sought out. How do I know that? Because that's the photograph he took, right in the same location. And that's what the big trestle looked like, just a wooden structure and, uh, Instead of opting, the, the, I guess, to make, you know, uh, 500,000 uh, cartloads of stuff, they decided to build the trestle. Anyway, and there's his actual photograph. Now I'm standing on the abutment on the west side of it. You can see the cut coming out here. There's the road bed, and that was the, um, the east abutment and the trestle came right where I would be standing. So now I'm walking back on the Union Pacific grade. You know, they used a lot of cut and fill. It's a false cut. Um, that's what that looks like, this kind of right here. They started to go this way, and I guess somebody had the bright idea, hey, guys, if we move over 10 feet, we can kind of go around that mountain and, you know, not, don't have to cut through it. Oh, that's a good idea. So, um, you know. It's a little cave. There was a little sign out here that said that the workers, remember, this is a high desert. I was out there. The convention was in July. It was probably 90 plus degrees the day I was there. And they said that, you know, temperatures could easily, you know, get up to 100 degrees. And so this little cave they use as shelter from the heat. You know, if they take a five minute break or something, they go in the cave because it was, it was, it, it could be, you know, 30 degrees cooler inside that little cave. I don't know how far back it went, probably not too far back, but uh, just enough that they can go and get out of the heat, get out of the sun and uh, take a quick breather. 
before I took this walking tour when I was at the visitor center inquiring about it and all that, they said, it's a very hot day today. Be sure you take at least two bottles of water. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't think they were just trying to sell me water. They, they were really serious about it. And sure enough, uh, it's only a mile and a half walking and I'm in pretty good shape for my age. I, uh, I, I drank all both bottles of water. So uh, again, it is the desert. So if you go out here, uh, be sure you, if you take the walking trail, uh, be sure you take the necessary precautions. And all right, so you can also drive the seven mile driving tour on the west and there's a like a three mile driving tour on the east. And, you know, I was out there for today the and may never get back there again. So I thought, well, I'm going to do that. So it's seven miles on the Pacific roadbed, the Central Pacific roadbed. It's the, it is the original 1860s roadbed. So, you know, this is like having a time machine in a sense, because the area hasn't changed all that much because you don't see any big buildings. You don't see any businesses. You don't see anything out there, right? And along that roadbed is the site of the famous 10 miles of track in one day, a record which still hasn't been broken considering the advancement in, in construction technology over 150 years. You can view the cuts and fills as you drive through them. You, repair, you can see the parallel grading efforts. So this is a lot longer area, it's seven miles. So the entrance is down here and you exit up here in the right uh, upper right of your screen. And you can see the dual grading going on there. You can see the Central Pacific. That's the one you're actually driving on. It's more defined. You can see it's, it's, it's a, a, a better um, a hewn path than the Union Pacific Railroad, which kind of fades out in some of the areas. But again, this double grading went on for something I think they said 254 miles. I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's incredible. So, when I was out there driving, I mean, look around. That's what it looked like 150 years ago. Nothing. There's nothing there other than the landmarks, the mountains, the hills, the sagebrush. And when I was driving this, and you can, and, and again, I rest my case. Look around. There's nothing there. All right. And when I'm driving this, it was easy for me to imagine sitting in a cab of a, of a locomotive with a balloon stack, one of the old balloon stack locomotives, uh, just winding my way uh, eastward um, because the scenery is, is still the same. One of the methods they use for cut and fill, they use the stair step cuts. And I think there are five different levels that they're operating on here. And it allowed members to work without getting in each other's way. So they attacked it in, in, in five different areas. But look, it's all manual, all manual labor. I mean, I, I, I know that they did have dynamite because on some of the stones, you can see um, drill marks for where they did place dynamite. But everything else, you don't see any, uh, I know they had steam shovels at the time, but you don't see any here working. And you drive the uh, section of the 10 miles of track late in one day. And that's because there was tremendous pressure on them. So look at the date, April 28th. That's 12 days, less than two weeks before the actual Golden Spike ceremony. So once they named the place and the date, these guys said, oh my God, we got to get the railroad there. So they, I can imagine it was all hands on deck for that, that day that they laid 10 miles of track because they had less than two weeks to get it to promontory so that they could uh, uh, have the uh, uh, ceremony. That's the original sign uh, that's now in the museum. I thought that was cool, all wooden. So <clears throat> this is one of the work camps that was just west of promontory. And uh, you know, if you notice, it's an interesting photograph again, Notice all the tents, right? Everything was portable. You had to pick it up and move it. Notice these railroad cars over here. Look at the tents on the top of them. So I don't know if these cars had holes in the roofs or, or what, or if they're just using uh, areas, but uh, 
uh, I, I'm not, it's hard for me to fathom somebody building a tent on the top of a box car, especially if it has a, a peaked roof like this one here. So, um, uh, but again, tents all over, you know, the, the, the flat cars to hold the, the, the rail, to hold the, the ties, um, you know, everything you need to build a railroad. Now, the East Driving Tour is very short. It's only two miles by comparison, seven of the other ones, so uh, it's considerably shorter. Also, you're on the 1860s roadbed. It's the site of the Chinese Arch National Memorial, which is uh, um, sort of a dedication to the, to, the, to the Chinese people who uh, a lot of sweat and blood, and I'm sure a lot of lost lives uh, building that railroad. Uh, view the Union Pacific's last cut where they, you know, that was the last cut they made and they realized, okay, we're, you know, we're done. We're not going to build anymore. I guess they figured that the Central Pacific won out or, or I'm not, not sure how all that played out. I'm a little bit rusty on that part of the, the history. Uh, again, once again, you can see the parallel grading efforts. Um, so uh, there's the park access road. And the park would be to the left of the screen because I'm east now of the of the museum and uh, visitor center. So you're driving on. I'm driving on the Central Pacific roadbed, and the Union Pacific is it, it's it's that one right there. And if you follow it around, it's not this road. That's a road right here. Okay, that's an access road of some sort. There's the grade. You can see it kind of fades out along the way. And somewhere along there is the last cut. Yeah, they, they cut through here and that was, they, they were done. The last big cut, I guess. And you can see at one point, the two grades almost touch each other here, coming around. Uh, so you don't, it's, it's nice. You can drive this in your air conditioned car. Uh, you can see some areas where there used to be some kind of small trestles to bridge that gap. You know, I'm on the Central Pacific. That's the Union Pacific. Again, you can see how close it is. That's the Chinese Arch. There's some natural land formation there. So that's a Chinese labor camp. Uh, again, the labor camps, lots of tents. Um, you know, the, the whole time I'm out there, especially when I was walking, I was consuming a lot of water. And I wasn't even working, right? I'm not swinging a mallet, driving, lifting rail, putting down ties. How do these people get water in the middle? I don't see any water tanks. I don't see anything. Uh, you see some barrels here. They probably have water stored in there. But where did that water come from? Because there's no streams or anything nearby. How did they build this big expanse across this huge area of desert, of high desert, without any water? So I, I, I think I found the solution uh, how they did that in a couple of uh, photographs that we'll go into here. So <clears throat> again, these are just some of the types of, uh, uh, of pictures that were taken. Um, this happens to be at a locomotive at Taylor's Mill, which is in the Ogden, Utah uh, territory. It's a territory because I don't think it was a state at the time, right? So here's a typical passenger train, 1870. Now, if you notice at the time, they were still using wagon trains, right? Because that was a mode of travel. No automobiles. You had trains, obviously. Trains were still somewhat in their infancy by today's standards. But the wagon trains were very much alive and well. And you can see one headed out. Uh, uh, I don't know if those are settlers or if that's a supply train. Uh, I'm not sure, but, you know, they're, they're heading uh, uh, west. So now look at, I studied this photo also. I want to point out a couple things. So right behind this uh, locomotive is a flat car that's carrying some type of load. And you can see it's, it's got a wooden structure here going this way. Got some guys standing on it. Now notice this little, I don't know if that's a, a, a pole, whatever it is coming out of the ground there, okay? So whoever took this photograph, obviously the train is not moving at the time. You got some guy standing either on or very near the track. These guys are standing up on the load. They wouldn't be doing that if the thing was moving. Um, so my guess is that train is stationary. 
maybe watching the wagon train go by. Maybe they didn't want to scare the horses. I don't know. So whoever took this shot, I believe, walked over somewhere here and took a shot looking this way. Because pay attention in this pole and this load right here. So there's that, there's that little white, looks like a, uh, I don't know, I don't know if it's a dead tree or somebody planted a pole there. There's that load that's behind the locomotive, right? Uh, looks like some people have wandered out here maybe to, to take a, a closer view at the Great Salt Lake, I'm not sure. But, you know, it's really, it's really interesting when you look at these photographs, you know, it, it's obviously, I think the same train at the same moment on the same day, 150 years ago, and uh, I just thought, you know, find that fascinating, you know, because I'm out there photographing, you know, 150 years later, I'm out there photographing all the photographs that you see here, right? So somebody was doing it even then. Here's how they had their water supply. Here's how they solved their water supply. Look at these big vats, right? And they put them on flat cars. So this is an open load of water, if you will. And and I don't know where this particular location is unknown. So I don't know where this, this reservoir station is. But you can see a whole train of water going out, right? Because you had hundreds of workers, right? Especially if you're laying 10 miles of track in one day. In the high desert, in the middle of the summer, they're going to get thirsty. So... Let's haul the water out. And I'm sure every camp had their own barrels or whatever that they transferred it in the barrels, emptied the, emptied the vats, sent the train back and filled it up again. So that's, that's how they met their water needs, I believe. Seems reasonable. So this is a steam locomotive. They, they didn't use this in construction, but they used it for loading ballast to be placed on the track. So they, they filled up uh, gondola cars or whatever with ballast, and um, uh, so they did have some steam equipment back in the day. So this is a work train and construction crew, uh, crew campsite, and the, the car with the drapes on it, that's the superintendent of constructions, his private car, right? I mean, he's, he's the foreman, he's the lead guy, so he's going to, he's not going to live in a tent like this, right? I mean, he's, he's now risen above that. He's going to live in a little a uh, uh, luxury private car there, okay? But you can see the work camp. Everybody's all set up in the, in the train itself. So uh, another picture of a work train. Uh, there's the private car without the drapes, right? Without the drapes, they're, they're pulled in. And they're having a little gathering. Maybe it's a little uh, uh, Sunday night dinner or something. There's some, some few of the workers coming over or whatever. Uh, the, uh, the the ladies there uh -huh. maybe prepared a meal. I, I don't know, but uh, uh, that's certainly the superintendent's car and um, whatever's going on. So just another archival photograph. Uh, look at the number of balloon stacks in this. I can count, I think, see one, two, three, four, five. Uh, assuming this engine here, it might be six. One in the back there is seven. So probably seven active locomotives at this one site because it's either a locomotive repair facility, it says machine shop, so my guess is that it's a locomotive service facility, not necessarily repair, but whatever type of service your locomotive would need because there seems to be a, a quite a few of them there. And that's Elko, Nevada. You know, the very early days of westward, westward movement and the railroad, uh, an interesting note, if you look at this turnout here, that's a stub turnout. The points don't move, okay? This section of the track moves over to a line here because that's those are fixed pieces of track there. And if you look where the switch linkage, it's connected to the head end here. So that's the old style of stub turnout. So I think it's, it's an interesting photograph. So there are some of the dignitaries that showed up, right? This is a big event, man. The, the, the two railroads come together. So what happened to the Golden Spikes? Well, I think there were four of them. 
And at least one of them is currently on display at the Canton Arts Museum at Stanford University in Northern California. Uh, there's a photograph of it and it's got, uh, you know, looks like some etchings or engravings. I'm not sure. Uh, whatever happened to the other ones, I don't know. Maybe there's one or two floating around on display somewhere that I'm not aware of. But at the time I did the research, this is, this is what I was able to find. So if you're ever out at Stanford University in Northern California, you can stop in the Canton Arts Center and check out one of the actual uh, golden spikes that was used uh, in, in 1869. So, uh, gentlemen, that ends the presentation. I will quit sharing my screen.